Sure. Please stand for the jury. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm just going to ask the witness stand to be sworn. Please swear or affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth on the penalty of law. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. state your name for the record and spell it. Chris Ware, C H R I S W A R E. Thank you. You may proceed. I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself for the jury. Um, you were, were you formerly a sergeant with the New Mexico State Police? Yes, I was. For how long did you do that? Uh, how long were you with the New Mexico State Police? Approximately 18 years. What are you doing now for a living? Um, I work for the National Insurance Crime Bureau. Were you called to the open space area where James Boyd was on Sunday, March 16th, 2014? Yes, I was. Why were you called to the scene? Um, we received a call that uh, APD was requesting state police. Uh, they were dealing with a male subject that wanted to speak with state police. Okay. When you got that call, what did you do? I believe I was in Edgewood at the time. Uh, left Edgewood, made my way to the foothills. When you arrived at the scene, Sergeant Warren, I'm still going to call you Sergeant. Uh, when you arrived at the scene, did you see anybody that you knew? Uh, very shortly after I arrived, uh, Keith Sandy drove up in a pickup truck. Was it your impression that he had just arrived? Yes. How did you know uh, Defendant Sandy? Um, I worked with him for some time in the state police. When you first saw him after he pulled up in his truck, what was he doing? He was putting his police equipment on. What did you see him put on? Vest. Getting some some of his uh, weapons and belts together to to get dressed. Did he have his rifle at that time? I believe so. Did he also have mace? I don't recall. I didn't really look at his equipment belt, but I would assume. Before we get into the conversation that you had with Mr. Sandy, I want to ask you first about the New Mexico State Police camera and microphone systems that you were using that day. Can you describe that for us, please? Uh, it's a Coban system that's installed in uh, most of the state police cars. Uh, anytime you engage your emergency equipment, the camera starts recording. Um, automatically turns on your microphone on your belt. So when you, when you turn the lights on in your car, Yes. It will record. Is that fair? Yes. Which thing? 
When you arrived at the scene, Sergeant, on March 16th, 2014, did you have your lights engaged? Yes, I did. Was your dash camera and your microphone recording? Yes. Have you watched and listened to the camera recording of your interaction with Mr. Sandy from that date? I may have seen bits and pieces of it. Uh, I don't recall. It's, it's been a while since I've seen it. When you last saw it, did it fairly and accurately show the conversation that you and Mr. Sandy had when you saw each other on that date? It, it was fairly clear. It wasn't 100% clear, the audio, but yes. At this time, Your Honor, the state moves admission of Exhibit 12B, which is the Coban uh, video and audio that we've discussed throughout this trial. Okay. Well, then we'd like to play it at this point, Your Honor. That's fine. Oops, hang on. Can you pause that mic? Let's see. There we go. Was that the conversation that you had with Mr. Sandy at the scene on March 16th of 2014? That was part of the conversation, yes. Did you have a longer conversation with him? I believe we talked about a couple other things. I don't recall exactly what we talked about. We were there longer than that conversation, though. Okay. Not much longer, but yes. At some point, did you encounter Albuquerque Police Department personnel other than Defendant Sandy before you went up to the scene? Uh, yes. When you were trying to figure out what was going on, did you have a, a question that you asked about some possible options about how to handle this? Yes. What did you ask? Uh, I asked if um, they had asked uh, Mr. Boyd to move 300 or so yards to the National Forest Boundary. Why did you wonder that? If it was just illegal camping, uh, that would have been one way to deal with it. Was it your understanding, Sergeant, that it was legal to camp just 300 yards away from Mr. Boyd's uh, camp where he was set up? I believe you can camp in National Forest, so yes. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Yeah. Did you ever tell Mr. Sandy that your tape was recording? I don't recall saying that, no. Okay, thank you. Can you pass the witness, Your Honor? Cross exam. Thank you, Your Honor. I think they're having trouble hearing the witness. <clears throat> so I'll just ask you to speak up, Sergeant. You can take this off the screen. Oh, it's off. Um, good morning, Sergeant. Good morning. Sergeant, would you agree with me that um, you were bantering back and forth with Keith Sandy that night when you first saw each other? Yes. Um, you've known each other for a long time, and you, and you kid each other a lot, don't you? We, we worked together for quite a while before he went to the Albuquerque Police Department. And you've actually done other things like coach Little League together, isn't that correct? Yes. And so uh, sometimes you, 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 the two of you may use uh, inappropriate language, wouldn't that be correct? Yes. Okay. When you were up in the foothills observing Mr. Boyd, and you actually went up and observed Mr. Boyd, didn't you? When you were up there observing Mr. Boyd, is it fair to say that every time he was asked to drop his knives, that he would get more angry? 
No, you may you may not, but you got into um, this witness's interaction at the scene, so it's not beyond the scope. So my question again was, every time um, when you were there, and you what you observed, every time Mr. Boyd was asked to drop his knives, he would get more angry, wouldn't he? Yes. In fact, I had asked him to put his knives down and come talk to us, and he just got agitated. Okay. And by the way, you were just wearing your state police uniform at the time, right? Yes. You weren't wearing a, 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 a rifle, were you? No. It was just your uniform and you had a sidearm, correct? Yes. And your normal duty belt? Yes. Nothing else, right? Nothing else. Mr. Sandy never told you that he was ever going to shoot Mr. Boyd or use lethal force on Mr. Boyd, did he? He never told me. Um, sustained. He never told you that he was going to shoot Mr. Boyd with a rifle? No. It's fair to say also that you were never concerned at any time that Mr. Sandy had the intention of going up and shooting Mr. Boyd. Isn't that correct? Excuse me, your objection calls for speculation. Okay. His concern. Overruled. Let me, you want me to ask the question again? Yes, sir. Fair enough, sir. You were never concerned at any time that Mr. Sandy had the intention of going up and shooting Mr. Boyd, were you? No. Oh, and by the way, you've come to learn, haven't you, that it was more than just illegal camping, wasn't it? Yes, after I spoke with him. I met with an APD sergeant, and he had explained the other uh, incident or the, the com total incident that had happened prior. Okay. Overruled. He had explained to you that he pulled out two knives on two police officers, right? Yes. Can I just move you? Morning, Sergeant Ware. Morning. I want to start by expanding on the background on, of your uh, career with the New Mexico State Police. So you were with the state, New Mexico State Police from 1997 to 2015, correct? Yes. And during that time, you were a patrol officer? Yes. Narcotics agent? Yes. Patrol sergeant? Yes. Narcotics sergeant? Yes. Criminal investigation sergeant? Yes and the commander of the New Mexico State Police Tactical Team, correct? That's correct. And as the commander of the New Mexico State uh, Police Tactical Team, you oversaw the entire tactical team that is responsible for dealing with uh, crisis situations throughout the state, is that correct? For the New Mexico State Police, yes. And at the time of the March 16th, 2014 incident, you were a sergeant with the New Mexico State Police, correct? Yes. If you would, please briefly describe your duties and responsibilities as a sergeant uh, with New Mexico State Police. Uh, sergeant, patrol sergeant is uh, primarily responsible for overseeing uh, patrol functions of patrol officers. Um, primarily responsible for uh, uh, making sure patrolmen are, are doing their job um, assisting them on calls for service, uh, giving them advice, uh, making sure they're following policy and procedures, um, showing up to critical incidents uh, to oversee critical in incidents. Um, there's there's other things as well. Uh, and you mentioned that, that you were you were responsible for showing up and overseeing critical incidents. Is that correct? Yes. You had a lot of experience dealing with incidents where someone was in crisis, correct? Yes. And those individuals could either have been just completely rational-minded individuals or individuals with mental illness, correct? Excuse me, Your Honor, this is Whitney. I'm just going to interrupt. I'm going to overrule the objection. Would you like me to re-ask Yes, sir. 
during your, your time with state police, you had experience um, overseeing incidents that involved individuals who were experiencing crisis, correct? Yes. And those individuals were sometimes rational-minded individuals, correct? Yes. And there were times when you dealt or oversaw your officers dealing with individuals with mental health issues, is that correct? That's correct. Now, on March 16th of 2014, you were dispatched to 1812 Piedra Vista, correct? Yes. And you were dispatched to an actual incident that was taking place in the foothills near the top of Copper, correct? Yes. And you mentioned at the time you were dispatched, you were located in Edgewood. That's, That's correct. correct. And Edgewood is approximately 15 or 20 miles away from uh, the top of Copper, correct? Yes, approximately. And in fact, it's in a completely different county. It's in Santa Fe County. Is that correct? That's correct. And you were contacted because APD officers wanted you to respond to this incident taking place in the foothills, correct? They wanted me to respond based on the person they were dealing with at his request. And the person they were dealing with is James Boyd, correct? That's correct. And James Boyd had requested a liaison with the state police, correct? Yes. And in response to that request, APD had you travel over approximately 15 to 20 miles simply to talk to Mr. Boyd, correct? Yes. And your intention in this was to try and peacefully resolve the incident that was taking place, is that correct? My intention was to show up because APD had asked for our assistance. So we typically assist any agency that requests our assistance. So I showed up um, to assist APD with whatever they needed. And that at the time was to speak with Mr. Boyd because he had requested state police. When you arrived at 1812 Piedra Vista, you parked in front of the, the residence there, correct? Yes. And I noticed on the video we, we just watched that there was a state police car in front of you, is that correct? Mm, that's correct. And whose car was that, if you know? That would have been Officer Mitch Bingston's unit. And Officer Miss, Mitch Bingston is also a New Mexico state police officer, correct? At the time he was a patrolman, yes. And based on the location of his car, he arrived before you arrived, is that correct? That's correct. <clears throat> Now, at some point, you walked from your car um, into the foothills, correct? Yes. And you got to the foothills by walking through the side yard of 1812 Piedra Vista, correct? Yes. And when you arrived in the foothill area, you saw several APD officers on the hill near uh, where you later learned James Boyd was, correct? Yes. And at some point, as you approached that location of those officers, you saw Mr. Boyd on the mountain. Correct? Yes, I did. And Mr. Boyd was at a significantly higher elevation than where you were at, correct? That's correct. Now, during your examination, uh, the state's examination of you, you talked about this, this possibility of having Mr. Boyd simply move up into uh, the National Forest. Is that correct? At the time, yes. And you made that suggestion, suggestion to an APD officer or sergeant when you first got on the scene, correct? I believe so, yes. And at the time you made that suggestion, you thought APD was interacting with Mr. Boyd simply because he was illegally camping, correct? Yes. You did not know that Mr. Boyd had threatened two AP officers with knives, is that correct? I did not at that time. You did not know that Mr. Boyd had committed a felony crime against two APD officers, is that correct? That's correct. Overruled. And Sergeant Ware, if you would have known that Mr. Boyd had committed a violent felony crime against the APD officers, you would have never suggested that they simply let him move up into the National Forest, correct? I would never have said that. That would have been would unsafe, known. correct? Yes. That would have put officers at risk? Is that correct? Yes. And that could have also put the community at risk? Yes. Now, after you saw where Mr. Boyd and officers were located, you hiked up to their position on the mountain, correct? Yes, I did. And when you approached Mr. Boyd, you were able to see him more clearly, correct? Yes, he was. Can you describe his appearance for us? Disheveled. Um, it appeared he had layers of clothing on, um, unshaven. 
And as I was approaching, he was rambling on about, I don't remember what, but it wasn't making any sense. Okay, and you mentioned that Mr. Boyd had layers of clothing on. Was that concerning to you? He appeared to be a homeless person, so uh, at the time it wasn't very concerning to me. Okay. Now, when you got close to Mr. Boyd, you engaged him in a conversation. Is that correct? I attempted to, yes. Okay. And why do you say you attempted to engage Mr. Boyd in a conversation? Like I said, he wasn't speaking coherently. He didn't make any sense. The things that he was saying were kind of out there, uh, making statements about being a CIA operative or DOE secret agent, some stuff like that. Okay. And it's fair to say that Mr. Boyd told you that he was a spy with the Department of Energy. Yes. He was some sort of government agent. Yes. And he also told you that he was a trained killer, is that correct? Yes. Now, after you began speaking to Mr. Boyd, um, you were informed by an APD sergeant that he was in possession of knives, is that correct? Yes. And during your examination that was conducted by Mr. Bregman, you mentioned that, that you asked Mr. Boyd if he would put down his knives. Is that correct? That's correct. And you wanted Mr. Boyd to put down his knives because knives are dangerous, is that correct? Yes. Knives can be used to stab an officer, correct? Yes, they can. Knives can be used to cut an officer, is that correct? Yes. Neither one of those could result in the death of an officer, is that correct? Yes. Now, despite your request, Mr. Boyd did not put his knives on the ground, correct? That's correct. And in fact, he became agitated. That's correct. And that was something you noticed throughout this incident, that every time the subject of Mr. Boyd's knives would come up, he would become agitated, correct? Yes. He would get angry, correct? Yes, he would raise his voice and become more angry. And that was concerning to you, wasn't it? Well, it was one of the subjects that probably shouldn't be repeated because uh, it kept agitating him, so it didn't make sense to, to keep asking him and keep agitating him. And that was a problem because Mr. Boyd had to put down his knives before he could before this, this incident could be resolved, correct? I believe there was mention of getting him a hotel room if he cooperated um, by putting the knives down, which he obviously didn't comply with. Um, but yes, every time he was asked to put the knives down and come talk to us, take him to a hotel room, he just became agitated. So the one thing that was going to resolve this situation, Mr. Boyd putting his knives down, was also the one thing that was causing him to become increasingly agitated. Is that correct? Yes. Now throughout, and uh, you didn't observe those officers uh, threatening Mr. Boyd in any way, did you? No. You didn't observe those officers demeaning Mr. Boyd in any way, did you? No. Those officers were acting in a completely professional manner, is that correct? From what I heard, yes. Now, as you were observing Mr. Boyd, you didn't see any indication that he was going to cooperate with the commands that were being given to him, correct? I didn't get that feeling that he was going to cooperate at all. And you didn't see any indication that Mr. Boyd was going to surrender, is that correct? No. Boyd never said, I surrender. Is that correct? I never heard those words come out of his mouth. You never heard him say, I give up. Is that correct? Never heard that. You never heard him say, I'll drop my knives. Is that correct? Never heard that either. And during your time near this incident, you also did not see Mr. Boyd engage in any kind of activity that suggested he was going to surrender. Is that correct? I don't recall seeing anything that would lead me to believe he was going to cooperate. You never saw Mr. Boyd put up his hands, is that correct? Not in a motion where it could be construed as he's going to start cooperating. Okay. Um, he made a lot of hand movements, hand gestures. So. But he never put his hands up no. in a way that suggested he was going to surrender? No. 
He never dropped to his knees, is that correct? No, not that I ever saw. He made no physical gesture whatsoever that suggested surrender. Is that correct? Not to my knowledge. Now, after your brief interaction with Mr. Boyd came to an end, you returned um, to the bottom, to the, to the base of the hill where Mr. Boyd was at. Is that correct? Yes. And you returned um, to that position because you were going to be part of a perimeter. Is that correct? Not necessarily part of the perimeter. I just stayed down at the bottom of the hill to offer any assistance from the state police if they needed it. Okay, so although you were you were there still on scene, it wasn't your understanding that you were actually part of this perimeter. Is that no, correct? I was not part of the perimeter. Okay. And you remained at that position, um, standing by in case uh, the other officers needed help. You remained there for roughly um, an hour and 15 minutes. Is that correct? Yes. And during that time, you were able to hear K-9 officer Scott Weimer Skirch negotiating with Mr. Boyd, correct? That's correct. And based on all of your training, your experience, and the actual observations you made that day, Officer Weimer Skirch was doing everything he could to de-escalate the situation. Is that correct? Is there a question? Improper listening? Mm -hmm. Based on the interaction you heard between Officer Weimer Skirch and, and Mr. Boyd, in light of your training and experience, it sounded to you like Officer Weimer Skirch was trying to convince Mr. Boyd to drop his knives. Is that correct? That's correct. In fact, he engaged in that negotiation for roughly an hour that you heard, correct? He was there for quite some time, yes. And nonetheless, um, based on what you heard from Mr. Boyd as this negotiation was taking place, Mr. Boyd continued to get angrier and angrier and angrier. Is that correct? Yes. And he was getting angry because officers were asking him to put down his knives, correct? That's correct. You were present at the scene of the March 16th incident when shots were fired, Mr. Boyd, correct? Yes. That said, um, you weren't actually able to see Mr. Boyd um, at the time force was used against him. Is that fair to say? I was not looking up in that direction when the shots were fired. And you were also unable to see the officers who used um, force against Mr. Boyd, is that fair to say? I saw officers up there. I don't know exactly who was where, but yes, there was officers up there. But you couldn't see exactly what those individual officers were doing because you were too far away, is that fair? Yes. You did not specifically see a flashbang thrown, correct? I heard a flashbang. So you heard it. the flashbang go off, but you didn't actually see when it was thrown, is that fair? That, yes. You did not see a, uh, a taser shotgun fired at Mr. Boyd two times, did you? I did not see it. And you did not specifically see a canine deployed to try and apprehend Mr. Boyd, is that fair? I did not see that either. And lastly, you did not see Officer Scott Weimer Scourge approach Mr. Boyd, did you? No. Now, throughout your entire time, well, first, how long were you at this scene? How long were you in the foothill area uh, on that day? Approximately an hour and a half. And during that hour and a half um, that you were up there near Mr. Boyd's location, you could hear what he was saying, correct? Yes. Um, and you could also see Mr. Boyd for the majority of that time, correct? He made it clear that he knew where I was because he had threatened to kill me a few times. Oh, so Mr. Boyd had threatened to kill you a few times? Yes. And those threats were directed at you? Yes. And what specifically did Mr. Boyd say uh, when he was threatening to kill you? Uh, I don't recall his exact words, but he had mentioned that he would kill me, um, something about um, my uniform, uh, the way it looked, uh, I don't recall any, any other specific wording. 
But there was something about your uniform that made Mr. Boyd mad, correct? I would assume yes. And you would assume that because he said as much. He referenced your uniform when he was threatening to kill you. Yes. And on that day, as you discussed with Mr. Bregman, you were wearing a standard um, New Mexico State Police uniform, correct? Yes, black and gray. You did not have any additional tactical vests on, correct? No. You did not have any rifles slung across your chest, correct? No. You did not have a ballistic helmet on, correct? No. Nonetheless, Mr. Boyd honed in on your uniform, talked to you about it, and threatened to kill you. Not directly, but while I was down the hill, yes, he kind of made it clear that he was talking to me. So despite the fact that you weren't even close to Mr. Boyd, he was still threatening to kill you? Yes. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. No further questions. Sergeant, when you went up to the area where Mr. Boyd and the tactical officers were on the hill that you were just asked about, was he with the was he with the field officers at the time or the tactical officers at that time? The initial contact? Yes, sir. I believe it was field personnel. During that time when you were up there with the field personnel, did you ever see Mr. Boyd take out his knives? No. Did you ever have to shoot him? No. After you talked to Mr. Boyd for five minutes, we heard that you uh, walked down the hill. Is that right? Yes. After interacting with him, what did you suggest that Mr. Boyd needed? I believe I said he needed a mental eval. That was pretty at the time that he needed I'm sorry a, a mental evaluation you felt and I didn't hear what you said it you felt like it was pretty it's pretty obvious when you communicated that you thought he needed a mental evaluation was that right after you walked down the hill probably after speaking with him for a minute yes between the time that you said he needed a mental evaluation and the time he was shot and killed, how long passed? How long was that? I don't recall exact time. It was a little over an hour. Can you have a moment here? Did a psychologist or anybody to perform a mental evaluation ever come in that time or a little over an hour? I, I can't answer that. Did you I, ever see? No, nobody from state police. Sustain. Thank you. May the witness be excused, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You're free to go. The state may call the next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Mr. Barry Getz. State your name and spell your name for the record. My name is Barry Getz. Uh, spelling of the first is B A R I E. Last name is G O E T Z. Thank you. You may proceed. Good morning, Mr. Getz. Good morning. Would you please introduce yourself to the jury? 
Um, my name's Barry Getz. What is it that you do for a living? Um, currently, I'm still doing a forensic consulting on an independent basis on criminal and civil cases, and I've been doing that since uh, 20 or 2004 uh, when I retired. Uh, I also am a part-time instructor at Penn State where I teach courses in forensic science and criminal justice. Before I get into your opinions in this case, were you asked to evaluate the trajectory of shots um, fired on Mr. Boyd on March 16, 2014? Yes, I was. Before I get into what your opinions are, uh, I'd like to ask you about your background. Tell me about your education as it relates to crime scene investigation and reconstruction, please. Uh, yes, I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in Medical Technology from the Pennsylvania State University. I have a Master's of Science degree in Forensic Science uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. Tell me about your experience and your work experience in the area of crime scene investigation and reconstruction. Yes, ma'am. In 1978, I started with the Indiana State Police as a civilian employee assigned to the laboratory. Uh, I worked with the Indiana State Police until 1981 when I took a position with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation Laboratory System. I was assigned to the Pueblo Laboratory in Colorado. Uh, I had some limited responsibilities for crime scene processing when I was with the Indiana State Police. But I also, had, uh, but when I went to the CBI, I had a primary responsibility of processing crime scenes. Right. Have you ever had the opportunity to evaluate crime scenes then in those jobs? I'm, excuse me? Did you have the opportunity to evaluate crime scenes? Yes. Do you still do that in your consulting work? I do. Can you estimate for us the number of crime scenes that you've processed in your career? Uh, I made an approximate, uh, approximation a few years ago of uh, 250 crime scenes uh, when I was working with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and that was in 24 counties in Colorado, so not just the 19 counties that my laboratory covered. And again, that is an approximation based on the average number of crime scenes that I would have worked in a month. Were any of those crime scenes that you processed homicides? Uh, the great majority of them were homicides. Um, there were very few that uh, were not. Were you uh, called in to help investigate the crime scene and, and reconstruction in the shootings at Columbine? Yes, I was. Tell me about your role in that. I was assigned as the uh, team captain for Team 1, which my responsibility was to process uh, the library of the high school uh, where 12 individuals were deceased. Uh, my team was responsible for processing about two-thirds of the physical space and about 50% of the number of deceased. How did you come to be involved in the processing of that crime? Uh, the uh, Columbine crime scene was in the Denver metro area. Uh, at that time, I was a lead agent in the uh, Pueblo area, but also we had a number of people who did crime scenes. Uh, we were asked to respond to Columbine as additional crime scene personnel. How did you get to be team leader of Team One? Uh, I don't know. I wasn't part of that. I actually was standing there assuming that they would send some of the outlying crime scene people home when they picked my name. In doing crime reconstructions, have you analyzed the same type of evidence in other cases that you've analyzed here? Uh, similar evidence, certainly. Have you taught in the areas of crime investigation and crime reconstruction? Uh, I have. Uh, done some uh, training with police departments in Colorado, uh, normally an introduction type one day, um, crime scene reconstruction, blood stain pattern interpretation. Uh, I do cover it in uh, my forensic science course uh, that I currently teach at Penn State. Have you ever testified as an expert witness in the area of crime scene reconstruction and investigation? Yes, I have. Approximately how many times? 
in the the 12 years that I've been uh, pr private consulting, uh, approximately 15 times. Uh, prior to that, in the years where I worked for law enforcement laboratories, uh, an additional 15 times. How many times have you been accepted by a court uh, as an expert in the field of crime scene investigation or reconstruction? Uh, approximately those 30 times. You're on, well, are you still doing private consulting work? I, uh, in May of this year, I announced my um, retirement from the private consulting and uh, announced that on my website and have not accepted new cases since then. However, I still have some pending cases that haven't uh, reached their final disposition. Uh, so I do have some pending cases. However, I'm not accepting any new cases at this time. Are you continuing to teach in the area of crime scene investigation and reconstruction? I, I will at Penn State, yes. You're at this time the state offers uh, Barry Getz as an expert in crime scene reconstruction. Now we have Jack Black Foundation. Can I down the witness briefly? Briefly, yes. Good morning, Mr. Getz. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Getz, uh, my understanding is that you've not shot a rifle since 1969, right? That's correct. Okay, and my understanding is that you've never actually shot, well, that would of course mean that you've never actually um, shot the type of rifles that uh, Mr. Sandy or Mr. Perez were using on the day in question, right? Again, not since 69. Right. In fact, you also don't know anything about optics or anything um, that would be used as far as, you know, uh, for, let me see if I can get the specific words, scopes or optics. You're not familiar with them, are you? Uh, no. D do you understand that there was an optic device on each one of these rifles? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and um, you'd also agree with me that previous sworn testimony in this case was wrong, wasn't it? question I sustain that objection okay um, so if I understand it how many times have you been recognized as an expert in trajectory of rifle shots uh, specifically never okay and that's what you were introduced as to this court today by the prosecution right an expert in the trajectory of these bullet shots right I believe it was crime scene reconstruction. Okay, so you would agree with me that you're not an expert in the trajectory of bullet shots, right? You're not an expert in that. You've never been recognized as one, have you? Not that subfield, no, sir. But I've certainly used it in crime scene reconstruction for decades. I see, sir. But again, you've never been recognized as an expert. And, and, and basically, that's what you're here to testify to, is about where you think the bullets went, right? Correct. You've never been recognized before as an expert in that subset of where the bullets went, right? Well, I certainly have that, yes, sir. I thought you just said you have not been recognized as an expert in the trajectory of shots. You said not in that subset, didn't you? You said high-velocity rifle shots or rifle shots. Okay. All right. Let's talk about that. You've never been recognized as an expert in high-velocity rifle shots, have you? Correct. And that's because you're not one, right? Um, I'd, I'd have to have it defined better to whether I could. Well, well you've never even shot that. one in, 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 I don't know how many years that is, 70 to now, I don't know, 50, uh, 46 years. You haven't even shot a rifle, have you? That's correct. Okay. And you've never even looked through the scope that, or, or, the, or the aiming device of, of these guns, have you? That's correct. Yet you want to come in and tell the court that you're an expert in where these bullets went in this particular case, right? That's correct. Object for a lack of foundation, Your Honor, for this witness. Your Honor, may I also briefly voir dire the witness on a different subject? Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Goetz. Good morning. Now, you talked earlier about your training and experience in crime scene processing, correct? 
My experience, yes, sir. And, and the vast majority of specialized training that you've received relates to blood spatter analysis, blood stain pattern interpretation, and serology, which is the study of blood serum, correct? Yes, sir, the majority of my training. And you'd agree with me that this case does not involve blood spatter analysis, blood stain pattern interpretation, or serology, correct? Uh, not as it relates to what I would testify to, correct. Nor does it involve crime scene processing, as that's normally understood, correct? Correct. I did not process the scene. And you agree that there is a difference between crime scene processing and investigation and crime scene reconstruction, right? Yes, I would. In fact, you have no specific training in the type of crime scene reconstruction at issue in this case, do you? Uh, a specific course, I do not. Instead, what experience you do have comes from attending Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction conferences and presenting cases at those conferences, right? That and processing crime scenes, yes, sir. But we just agreed that you did not process this crime scene, correct? Correct. I was referring to the last. And that there is a difference between processing a crime scene and reconstructing it. Yes, there is. Okay. Your Honor, we have the same objection for lack of foundation.
state to um, address in more detail the crime scene reconstruction experience of this witness. Sure. How does your background training and experience uh, allow you, or what knowledge do you have that allows you to evaluate trajectory of uh, firearm shots? Well, certainly the trajectory of firearm shots or the trajectory of, um, for instance, uh, archery um, weapons, which of course have been also used at crime scenes, uh, is based on uh, my experience, first of all, with firing handguns and knowing that uh, when the bullet leaves the chamber, it normally travels in a straight line until it hits an intermediate object. And it also is affected by gravity, wind, etc., as it travels in that straight line. Uh, from uh, my first crime scene back in the 19, late 1970s uh, involving gunshots, um, I was there at the crime scenes evaluating the damage done by the gunshots and attempting a trajectory based on the flight of the bullet that caused that damage or caused that injury. Um, so crime scene reconstruction as far as firearms, uh, I've been doing those since the late 70s. Uh, and some of those involved rifles. Um, and in Columbine, there, there were rifles involved, um, not by the, uh, or by both sides, both the perpetrators and the police officers involved. Uh, so for since really the late 70s, I've been looking at crime scenes where trajectories were important from firearms and from long guns, and basic physics uh, would indicate when you can say a trajectory is present and measurable, and when you don't have enough trajectory points or damage to definitely define uh, the trajectory of the bullet. qualify um, Mr. Getz as an expert in crime scene reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Getz, what did you review in this case in order to ev uh, evaluate the crime scene? What did I? Yes, sir. Yes. Or what types of evidence did you review? I was provided the um, autopsy report of Mr. Boyd and the photographs taken during the autopsy of Mr. Boyd. I was provided um, photographs uh, from the crime scene processing. Uh, I was provided a copy of the videotape uh, from, the, from Officer Perez's um, camera, uh, both in um, regular raw video and also in slow motion formats. I was provided the um, transcript of the interviews of both officers, Perez and Sandy, has provided um, a, what I believe to be a portion of the Albuquerque Police Department's investigation report. Uh, I was uh, provided with some lab forensic laboratory results, and I believe that's most of it. How usual is it to have a video of an area you're investigating? Uh, for me, uh, this is the first uh, crime scene uh, that I've been involved in, a crime scene reconstruction of where there is a video of the actual um, firing of the weapons and um, hitting of Mr. Boyd by the projectiles. Uh, in the past, uh, some videos that uh, may show people walking to and from the crime scene, etc. but this is the first case I've had where a video actually depicting the series of events uh, surrounding uh, the shooting. Were you able to determine, based on your reconstruction and view of the video, whether your reconstruction is consistent with what's depicted in the video? Yes, it was. Can you tell us first what are your opinions about who fired the first shot, first three shots? Yes, the, the, f the first three shots that you see on the video are, are fired by um, Officer Sandy. All right, and I'm going to stop you there. Where does the first shot go? Uh, the first shot uh, is fired actually across the, the frontal plane of Mr. Boyd. Uh, it does uh, perforate at least the outer clothing on the right arm, uh, perforates uh, the different layers of the um, left chest of Mr. Boyd. Uh, there's five layers of clothing. It um, uh, 
penetrates all the way to the, the bottom and actually damages the innermost garment. Uh, it then strikes a blue bag that uh, you can see in the video that is slung over Mr. Boyd's left shoulder and it has a strap that's holding it and that blue bag also has a zipper top and the bullet uh, goes through that um, top portion of that bag and perforates it meaning that it goes in and exits uh, it then enters the clothing layers on the left arm uh, and perforates the left arm meaning that it goes in and comes out and of course it has to go through the five layers of clothing when it comes out of the left arm and then continues on that trajectory and strikes a, a large um, boulder that is there uh, on the hillside. All right. And Mr. Guest, we're going to go through the photographs uh, or you know your your reconstruction of this. Can, or testimony? All right. But so next, thank you. Uh, can you tell us uh, where Defendant Sandy's second shot hit Mr. Boyd? Uh, yes, ma'am. The the second shot fired by Officer Sandy. Uh, strikes the uh, right arm of Mr. Boyd and in the video actually causes a deflection uh, to the right arm upon impact. Uh, so it would, it penetrated through the five layers of clothing uh, and then uh, perforates the right arm. Uh, in this particular case it actually shatters the, the bone and as the autopsy describes it. And we'll we'll talk to about your consistency and how you correlated it in a moment. But to a testifying right now. So stay. Where does the Sandy's third shot hit Mr. Boyd? Or does it? What I haven't can I finish? Oh yes, I'm second? sorry. Yes, please. Uh, the second shot um, perforates uh, the right arm uh, and then um, strikes the clothing on the right chest and actually a fragment of the bullet. Um, is that he adheres to the right front chest area. Uh, it then continues across um, the front of Mr. Boyd and also strikes the large boulder, the same large boulder that the first shot struck. And where does Mr. Sandy's third shot go? Uh, the third shot um, penetrates the at least the outer fabric of the right arm uh, of Mr. Boyd. Um, it is not clear to me as to whether that bullet also caused damage to the right arm. However, it does, it does go into his clothing, comes out of his clothing, continues on, and strikes the large boulder, but in a, a different location than the first two. Were those the first three shots fired at Mr. Boyd? Yes, they were. Who fires the fourth shot at Mr. Boyd? Uh, Officer Perez then f um, commences his three shots. Where does uh, Mr. Pettis' first shot go? Um, the first shot is fired at, the, at Mr. Boyd, who has uh, been moving during the first three shots and actually rotating to his left and then starting like to... Like this, turning? Correct. He's rotating to his left and also starting to um, um, approach the ground, uh, leaning forward and going down where he eventually comes in contact with the ground. Um, Officer Perez's first shot then um, strikes Mr. Boyd in the uh, lower back, um, travels through his body, uh, through the armpit area, and is lodged in his, uh, the bullet's lodged in his shoulder. Uh, the next two shots actually go over top of Mr. Boyd. Where did the next two shots go? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Where do the next two shots from Defendant Pettis, Mr. Pettis go? Uh, the next two shots go over the top of Mr. Boyd. As he's falling down, the shots go over top of him. Um, they do not strike the large boulder that Officer Sandy's three shots struck because it's not in his line of fire. Uh, they rather uh, travel, I would assume, some distance and then finally came to ground. Now I'd like to go through the things and figure out how you know that. I'd like to show you State's Exhibit A, B, and C. You mentioned earlier looking at photos from criminalistics. What are photos A, State's A, B, and C? What's the number? I'm sorry, Your Honor. 57, A, B, and C. Are 
are those the photos that you reviewed from criminalistics? Uh, yes, these are some of the photographs. Did you rely on those photographs in your reconstruction? Um, certainly uh, some aspects of the photographs I did, yes. And are photographs from criminalistic scenes uh, types of things that you regularly rely upon in reconstructing and processing scenes? Yes, I examine tens of thousands of photographs. Now the state moves the admission of uh, states 57A through C. Any objection? Your Honor, we have no objection to 57A. We have no objection to 57B. We have no objection to 57C. No objection to any of those three, 57A, B, and C will be admitted. Thank you. Your Honor, may we have the podium Elmo on? Well, one of the things I didn't ask you in, in your review of evidence, did you actually go to the scene yourself? Yes, I did. I think it takes a minute to warm up here. photograph of the scene uh, that you discussed in 57A. Can you see it okay there? Um, it's pretty. It's not the clearest. Let's see if I can adjust it at all. Does that help or make it worse? <laughs> that's, that's clearer to me. Okay. There we go got some glare, but is that a photograph of the scene? It is, so now it's going dark. Oh. Okay. Let's see. All right. It's, I think it's, I'm moving it too quickly. Do you have anything on your screen, Mr. Gibbs? I can see the exhibit tag at the bottom. Yeah, there we go. There we go. How's that? Yes, it, there's a delay in how it comes. Okay. Up. Is that a photograph of the scene? Yes, that is a photograph of the scene. Now, what I'd like to show show you states exhibit 57B. What is shown in this photograph? This is the uh, what I refer to as the large boulder that the the three projectiles fired by Officer Sandy eventually struck. Uh, the orange tags uh, would have been used by the crime scene processors uh, to indicate their location, and they also designated them by number. It's hard to see in this photo. The jury will actually get the original photo, but it, are there impact numbers on the rock? There are. There's an I and then a dash and one, two, and three. And I can't tell by this photo which one is which. Okay. And then, states 57C, is that that same rock but without the impact indicators removed? Without the, with the little post-its removed. Can you yes, see that? Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's a little darker, but... I did examine the photo when I had it in front of me, and yes, that is the same rock. When you went to the scene, did you s observe the rock that's uh, shown in these photographs? I did. Were the mark Were there marks still on the rock? Uh, the marks are still there. They are they are faded. Um, I was there. Uh, I think thirteen or fourteen months after the shooting, and it is an outside outside environment. They were there but faded, is that what you said? Correct. They are still present, but they're not as crisp as you see them in the photographs. All right. I'd like to now 
ask you, when you were, well, what did you think was the best way to reconstruct this scene? In the, terms of figuring out the sequence of shots and the order, I mean the trajectory of shots. The, I was requested to attempt to determine which bullets uh, struck Mr. Boyd and where. And um, based on that, knowing that we have an outdoor scene, uh, we have one individual who was shot, we have uh, two individuals that are firing weapons uh, that eventually may or may not hit Mr. Boyd. I elected to, after reviewing the materials, uh, coming to Albuquerque, uh, going up on the hillside, and then um, repositioning uh, those three individuals at the time of the six gunshots. We've been going about an hour and a half. Shall I keep going? I'm in a decent bathroom break. If um, I think the jury came in around 9, so I'm going oh, to okay. get 10.30. You got it. No problem. All right. Unless anyone needs a break now. I don't see any hands. Okay. Did you take photographs during your reconstruction uh, that you just described? Yes, I did. I'd like to show you states 57D through Q and ask you if those are the photographs that you took when you were out at the scene that were taken when you were at the scene of the reconstruction, the stages of reconstruction. Yes, ma'am, they are. Do those photographs fairly and accurately depict the stages of your reconstruction as you were out at the scene? Yes, they do. The uh, state moves uh, 57D through Q. No objection, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. Uh, states 57D through 57Q are admitted without objection. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> Getz and 57D, can you tell us what you're doing there? Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I brought uh, two tripods and two lasers uh, with me to Albuquerque. Uh, this is one of the tripods with one of the lasers attached um, to the mount, to the moving head. Uh, I was given information that the two officers were five foot 10, five foot 11 inches tall. I'm in that same category. And so in order to approximate the distance from the ground that the weapons would have been at when they were fired, I took a stance of where I would naturally hold a long gun, uh, measured from the ground, and then set the laser at that same distance. How? How did you determine where to set the tripod? Uh, when we were on the hillside, we had our laptops with us that contained uh, crime scene photographs, but also the video um, of the event. And by looking at the various vegetation and rocks uh, and just the natural formations of that hillside, and again, going back and looking at the video and the stills, we were able to see where the feet of the individual uh, Mr. of Mr. Boyd were, uh, where uh, Officer Sandy was standing. And then by looking at the video and the rock formation as Officer Perez moves up and then uh, stays in that firing position, we could then show where Officer Perez was standing uh, when he discharged his weapon. I wanna, you were going to stop it. I was going to stop you too. This is at the, at what time are you evaluating the time of the shots? Yes, uh, this would have been the position uh, of both officers when they fire their weapon and also the position of Mr. Boyd at that same time. What is the distance from Mr. Boyd that um, your investigation revealed? How far was Defendant Sandy from Mr. Boyd at the time of his first shot? Or the uh, time of his shots? I, I have uh, uh, some notes that list those distances. Would it help you to look at those? It would. Sure. Thank you. Uh, 
you asked me officer sandy yes sir uh, the distance from mr boyd's right foot to the center of the tripod that represented <laughs> officer sandy's weapon is 12 feet nine inches <coughs> to show you 57e is this uh, tell us what we're looking at in 57e <coughs> is that where uh, mr pettis was yes this is a, a second tripod with a, a, a different laser this is a, a black laser uh, the laser that i used at officer sandy's position was a silver colored layers laser that produced a uh, orangish red uh, dot. Uh, this laser is a black laser on a separate tripod and it projects a green um, laser beam which re produces a green dot. And again, using um, how I would have held a, a shouldered a long gun, measure the distance, and we use the same distance for both officers to set the lasers on the tripod. What was the distance that you measured between Mr. Boyd and uh, Mr. Pettis at the time of his shots? That's approximately uh, 29 feet uh, from Mr. Boyd's right foot to the, the tripod representing where Officer uh, Perez fired from. Now, in, in, uh, on these tripods, what do you have? Do you have lasers? What are, what are you doing with these tripods? I'm using them as a means to hold um, the laser uh, in a fixed position, but also have the ability to rotate um, that laser. Uh, the laser, of course, projects a beam of light in a very straight line, and you can um, place a target anywhere in front of that laser, and you'll see then a green dot indicating um, where that laser beam is traveling. And you can do that along the entire length of that laser beam until you, you can't physically put anything in front of it in front of it anymore. So by using the two different colored lasers, um, we could tell at any time if by putting an object uh, object an object up that if the green dot was hitting it, that was the laser representing Officer Perez. If it was the orange red dot, that was Officer Sandy. You mentioned earlier that you watched the video um, of the shooting and in slow motion. Did you, when you when you watched the video in slow motion, you also did you create still shots at the time of each of the shots fired? Yes, ma'am. Like to show you States Exhibit Forty Eight D through F and ask if those are the still shots that you created and watching the video of the moment in time when each of the shots was fired. You said 48 through F. I'm sorry, A through F, Your Honor. But you said 48. Yes. Yes, ma'am. These are um, stills uh, from the video um, taken uh, at the time of the discharge of the six projectiles. Did you, uh, did these stills help you in your reconstruction of the trajectory and the shots fired in this case? Oh, they did. Uh, state news 48D. I said D, it is E. 48D through F. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. They're just out of order. A through F. Is, is A already in? A is already in. A is already in. I'm going to check to it. Let me just double check. Yes, A is already in. But did I understand that, that the witness said that this was the actual time the shots were being fired? That's my understanding. Still, stills from which shots? Can, can I have the witness on that specific? Because that's what they're being introduced as. Can I have Vordaya just very briefly on that? Yeah. 
So you are, if I if I understand this correctly, you are basing the time of the firing on sound. Uh, sound, uh, sound, and also um, motion. So you're basing it on part of the reason why you're saying that this is when these. These, these pictures show a shot was based on the sound that you're hearing at the video. That's at least part of it, right? Yes. You would agree with me, don't you? Well, do you know how fast these bullets travel? Um, I, feet per second, sir. I did look it up. I forget the number. Is it close to 3,000 feet per second, sir? Yes, it's very fast, yes. That is how many? Two or three times the speed of sound? Uh, yes, at least three times. It's at least three times the speed of sound, right? Correct. So when, when you hear the sound on the video, that's, that's delayed substantially from when the bullet had already been fired, right? Uh, not substantially at that distance. Well, a quarter of a second at least, right, sir? If you've done the math, you'd know that, right? I come up with a much smaller um, number. You come up with a much smaller number? And how did you do your math to figure that out for these pictures to say to this jury that these are an accurate reflection of when the shot was taken? Uh, using the, the speed of the bullet and the speed of sound and then looking at the distance, um, the distances involved on the, on the hillside. Right, but did you ever analyze the difference between how much length in time it would be from the time the, the bullet actually is shot and the time that you actually hear it on a real-time situation? Have you ever figured out how much time that is in between that? Yes. Okay, what is that number? Uh, I'm in the one, in, one five thousandths of a second range. Okay, and, you're, and that is your expert opinion today that you're saying it's in with one five thousandths. It's not a quarter of a second, sir. That's your expert opinion that you're telling this jury is a reliable opinion, correct? It's definitely less than the one, one twenty-fifth or one fourth. No, no you've, you've, already said, you've already said to me now what the exact amount was, right? One five thousand? Uh, approximately, one, approximately one five thousandths of a second, yes. And you're saying that that is your expert opinion? The, the distance, the difference between the time it would take tra sound to travel versus bullet to travel that distance. Okay, so you're saying the difference between the time it was shot to the time you hear the sound is one five thousandth of a second. That's what you just, that's what you're testifying to today, is that correct? The, From the time it's shot to the time you hear it, the dis, no, the um, the bullet traveling and the sound traveling, okay. so that when you hear the sound, the bullet has traveled that distance. Okay. So here's my question, sir, because we're getting back to the pictures, and this is specific to these exhibits. You're saying this arti these pictures articulate when each when each shot was fired, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so here's my question. Wouldn't you agree with me that from the time that either one of these officers actually pulled the trigger until the time you hear it is a quarter of a second? From the time that they pull the trigger to the time that you hear it on the video is a quarter of a second based on the speed of sound and the speed of these bullets. Isn't that correct? Do you know that? You're, you're using two different things. Um, there's the distance that the sound travels, and then there's the distance that the bullet travels. And this one-fourth of, one of a second is the distance that the sound travels from the gun to the microphone? You tell me, sir, what's the time difference between the time they pull the trigger and when you actually hear it? What's the time difference? That's what I'm asking you. Do you know? No, I never. I didn't measure that distance or that time. Okay. Your Honor, I, then unfortunately, I'm going to object to all these, these remedies for the fact that he can't. If he's saying that's what it reflects, and he's saying it was based on the audio. We concur on the same basis, Your Honor. Okay, um, 48, 8, 3, 8, 3, 8, 3, 8 through F will be admitted um, to show what this witness used as far as uh, the point in time. In addition to creating still shots uh, from the video,
did you look at clothing that Mr. Boyd was wearing at the time of the shooting for your reconstruction? I, I did have an opportunity to look at his clothing. Where did you get to look at his clothing? Um, it was at a, a, a laboratory setting at Albuquerque Police Department. Were you given a long time with his clothing? How long were you given with the clothing? Uh, one hour and 37 minutes. Was that sufficient for you? No. Who cut off your ability to examine the clothing at a longer for a longer time? Uh, the individuals who were handling the evidence. Where was the evidence stored? I'm sorry. Where was who were the individuals holding the evidence? I uh, I assume they were employees of the Albuquerque Police Department. When you had this time with the clothing, what did you do with it for your purposes in reconstructing the, the trajectory of shots? I would, I would um, have the inter I started with the innermost item of clothing that was at least identified as the innermost item, which is a, a white a short sleeve t shirt. Uh, took photographs of the front and back after re um, I want to say reconstructing, but putting the fabric back to where it's an original form because these, these clothes have been cut off of Mr. Boyd, plus they've been damaged. Um, and so rearranging them to where they would have been when they were one item, uh, photograph them, and then we place them on an individual um, to get a more three-dimensional aspect of where the damage uh, to the fabric was. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit R through U and ask you to seven R. I'm sorry, 57 R. Yes, 57 R through 57 U. And ask that these are the photographs taken of the items of clothing that you're referring to. Uh, yes, ma'am. These are photographs of uh, four of the items of clothing. All right. And you, did you take more photographs <laughs> of the clothing that I've given you? Yes, I did. All right. Construct the trajectory of the shot. Yes, I did. United States moves 57R through U at this time. No objection. Okay. 57R through 57U are admitted. All right. 57R, tell us, I think you just started to describe this, but what are we looking at in 57R here? Uh, this is a white short sleeve t shirt. All right, and what is significant to you about this white sleeve, this white short sleeve T-shirt? Uh, this is reported as being the innermost garment on Mr. Boyd, and there is damage to the fabric, um, both on the front left chest and front right chest, um, in addition to the the sleeves of the f uh, item. Uh, this damage is different than a damage caused by cutting the item off of Mr. Boyd, and it, and it represents damage that would have been created by um, bullets striking the clothing. All right. What are we looking at in 57S? Uh, this is a, a long sleeve. Um, I think it had a what they referred to as a Henley collar. Um, this was the, the second item of clothing uh, that Mr. Boyd would have had on. This would have been over top of the white t shirt. Okay. And we'll go through these individually, but just have you identify them. What do we have here in 57T? This is the next item of clothing. It's a black short sleeve t shirt with a V neck. Can't see that V neck very well here, but <laughs> correct. What do we see in 57U? This is um, 
uh, again, a long sleeve uh, referred to as the Nissan shirt because it has the name Nissan on it, but it also has the red stripes. Uh, this would have been the next item of clothing. Mike Schmidt, I'll show you 57V. Well, and let me ask you this. In addition to having the clothing laid out on a table and taking photographs like this, did you also, what else did you do with the clothing? Uh, again, we placed them on an, an individual uh, who was uh, within uh, an inch and a quarter of Mr. Boyd's height and, uh, and weighed about uh, 24 pounds less than he did. Uh, just to get a more three-dimensional uh, aspect of all these layers of clothing and how they relate to each other. I'm going to show you States 57B and ask you, is that a photograph taken of the white shirt while placed, or tell me what that is. Uh, yes, ma'am, this is um, uh, the white innermost garment, uh, the short sleeve uh, white t-shirt. Did you rely on that photograph in your reconstruction to help assist in determining the trajectory of the bullets? Yes. Now the state moves into evidence 57B. No objection. No objection, Your Honor. 57B is admitted. Did you also uh, put what you referred to earlier as this uh, gray and red jacket on a person. Uh, yes, ma'am, this is uh, the red black with red stripe Nissan uh, jack, uh, jacket or shirt. What is, uh, are you able to see trajectory from uh, analysis of that uh, shirt uh, in that photograph? Yes, I examined the uh, damage caused by the projectile on that shirt. United States moves into evidence 57W. 57W is I'd like to show you 57X. What is that? Uh, 57X is a, a gap uh, brand. Um, Pullover, hoodie, long sleeve, sweatshirt. Is that another photograph that you took during your reconstruction of the scene involving putting Mr. Boyd's clothing on a person? Yes, it is. Interstate moves into evidence 57X. 57X is in there. I'd like to show you 57Y. Can you tell me what that is? Uh, yes, ma'am. This is the same uh, off-white, grayish, um, long-sleeve, pullover, hooded sweatshirt that was Mr. Boyd's outermost garment. Does that photograph help depict what you were evaluating in your uh, reconstruction of the crime? Yes, ma'am. Right at the scene. into evidence, Your Honor, 57Y. I'd like to show you now states 57Z, 1, and 2. I'll ask you what those are. Yes, ma'am. These uh, are photographs not taken by myself, um, but uh, taken by the police department of uh, the evidence. Uh, this is the gray um, long sleeve hooded sweatshirt that was the outermost garment on Mr. Um, Boyd. And are there bullet defects reflected on that sweatshirt that helped aid you in your reconstruction of the sequence of, or the uh, trajectory of shots in this case? Yes, there are. The state moves into evidence 57Z1 and 57Z2. No objection. 57Z1 and 2 are admitted. All right. Well, 
close to my still shots here. All right, now I'm gonna go back to the first shot that you discussed. Um, Before you go back to the yes. first shot, does this seem to be a good place to bring? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, let's take a 10 minute recess. Please stand for the group.